Welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. If you're new here, this is the third part of a multi-episode arc on the American Revolution. If you want to get all the backstory, you'll want to jump back to episode 52, An Accidental Revolution, and start from there. A quick note before we get started, I've begun including some of my sources in the description. This is helpful not only for you because it makes it easy to find more information, but it's also helpful for me. See, the links I'm using are affiliate links, which means that if you decide you want to read, for example, Edward G. Lengel's George Washington, A Military Life, you just click the link in the description and buy it on Amazon. Then, at no extra cost to you, I earn a small cut of the sale. Anyway, enough self-promotion. Let's get on with the show. Where we left off last episode, George Washington and the Continental Army had encamped for the winter of 1777 to 1778 in the town of Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. The conditions in camp are harsh, and out of 12,000 men who make camp in December of 1777, only 10 or 11,000 are alive when spring arrives in 1778. At the same time, there have been many positive developments for the Continental Army. Baron von Steuben has arrived from Prussia and reorganized the Americans into a professional fighting force with improved camp sanitation and relentless drilling. Nathaniel Green, always Washington's right-hand man, has taken over as quartermaster general, responsible for ensuring that the last winter's supply issues never repeat themselves. Slowly but surely, Washington is building up a proper general staff for his army. And in February of 1778, thanks to the American success at Saratoga the previous year and the diplomatic efforts of the Marquis de Lafayette and Benjamin Franklin, King Louis XVI of France formally recognizes the young United States as a country and enters the war on the American side. Things on the ground have still looked bad for the Americans up until this point. I've beaten this dead horse several times now, but the British Empire is incredibly powerful and wealthy, and if they bring their full might to bear on their rebellious colonies, the colonists stand zero chance of winning their independence. Despite the disaster at Saratoga, the British had made pretty good progress in 1777. They'd captured Philadelphia, and they now control a swath of land from Rhode Island east to New York City, south across most of New Jersey to Philadelphia, the American capital. With another year or two of campaigning, they can bring the colonists to their knees simply by occupying the entire coastline. But the entry of France into the war changes everything. So before I go any further... I want to talk about the geopolitical situations of Great Britain and France in early 1778. The important thing to remember about the British Empire is that it's a trade empire. Tea from India, sugar from the Caribbean, and slaves from West Africa all form the backbone of its economy. By comparison, the cotton, tobacco, and timber produced in the North American colonies are relatively unimportant. Until now, the Continental Army has had the ability to be a pain in King George's backside, but it hasn't posed an existential threat to the empire. The French colonial empire, by comparison, is much more modest consisting of a few small, unfortified trading outposts in India, along with the Caribbean island of Martinique, which is the first coffee producer in the Western Hemisphere, plus Guadeloupe and St. Lucia, which produce sugar. But the French nation itself dwarfs Great Britain, with a population of approximately 25 million compared to Britain's 6 to 8 million. The homegrown economic base is much larger, as is the industrial base, as is the army, 
Britannia might rule the waves, but the French army is the largest and arguably the most feared in Europe. If the French can manage to slip past the British fleet and start landing troops all over the British Empire, it can damage British trade. Take away trade and you can bring the great trade empire to its knees. And the British face a problem here. Because while in a big fleet-on-fleet action of the Royal Navy versus the French Navy, the Royal Navy would have a major advantage due to numbers, that's not the scenario. The British have to keep a fleet at home to prevent a French invasion across the English Channel, while the idea of 1778 Britain invading 1778 France with no allies on their side is a non-starter, so... The French don't have to worry about always keeping a fleet at home to defend against the British. See, the French are allied with another big continental power, the Austrians. And while the Austrians aren't going to take part in the American Revolution, a British invasion of France's European possessions would trigger the defensive alliance and cause Austria to declare war on Britain. All of this is to say that, despite the superiority of the Royal Navy on paper, it also has to stand up as a bulwark to defend the British Isles, which the French don't need their navy to do. So the British still have to be careful about where they deploy their ships outside of home waters. In this case, they reposition most of their naval assets to the Caribbean. Again, this makes sense given how incredibly valuable those sugar plantations are. The British need to protect their trade. But this deployment of naval resources leaves British forces in the North American colonies vulnerable should the French choose to land any troops. So instead of launching a second attack in the southern U.S. as planned to support their operations in the north, uh, the British, specifically British Prime Minister Lord North, plans to reduce the number of troops in North America to focus on an assault on the French Caribbean island of St. Lucia. From a geostrategic perspective, this is logical. Take out those French Caribbean colonies quickly and then you've pretty much dealt with the French overseas empire, and you can fight your naval war from there. But it leaves the new British commander-in-chief in North America, Sir Henry Clinton, with an unpleasant responsibility. With his force being downscaled, he is to evacuate Philadelphia while simultaneously serving as chief commissioner on a commission for peace that offers the American revolutionaries everything they want as long as they continue to legally acknowledge King George as their head of state. Congress will ignore this peace commission, but the appointment of General Clinton as commander-in-chief of the British military is worth examining more closely. In his book, Portrayal of a General, Sir Henry Clinton in the War of Independence, American historian William B. Wilcox writes, quote, War against France was an old game with conventional moves. The West Indies were a more important part of the board than North America, and a blow at St. Lucia was in the best tradition of the Seven Years' War. Success depended on secrecy and speed, and the nearest available troops were under Clinton's command. Once he detached a force to the Caribbean, he would not have enough men left to hold Philadelphia, New York, and Rhode Island, let alone to raid the New England coast. It is a joke, the king promptly concluded, to think of keeping Pennsylvania. Lord Amherst concurred. He urged evacuating it at once, and the cabinet accepted in substance the views of the veteran soldier, who was now commander-in-chief of the army in Britain, and conveyed its decision to Clinton in a letter of March 21st and formal instructions from the king. 
The letter expressed the hope that New York might be held in order to help the work of the commissioners, but the instructions authorized evacuation if the commission failed and the garrison was in danger. In that case, Rhode Island should, if possible, be held, but how it could be supplied, presumably from Nova Scotia, was not explained. Clinton was to fall back on Halifax if worst came to worst, and do what he could to reinforce Canada. On these matters, his instructions left him leeway. But on two points, they did not. He was ordered to embark 5,000 men at once for St. Lucia, and 3,000 for the Floridas, and to evacuate Philadelphia by sea. His command was to begin with the crippling of his field army, followed by a retreat that might take him all the way to Nova Scotia. End quote. As I mentioned, Henry Clinton is the new British commander-in-chief in North America, William Howe, the previous commander-in-chief who had captured Philadelphia and arguably failed to support John Burgoyne in his Saratoga campaign, well, he had resigned the previous fall in October of 1777 and has been waiting for his replacement to arrive. Ironically, Howe is resigning because he feels that he's received insufficient support from the British Isles, so you can only imagine what he'd think about having to pack up and leave a bunch of captured territory so his men can go fight in the Caribbean instead. Anyway, on May 18, 1778, Captain John Andre, the head of the British Secret Service in North America, who we'll meet again later, well he throws a going-away party for General Howe, with several major dignitaries in attendance, including General Clinton, who has just arrived and has yet to take formal command. This is an elaborate party with fireworks, an artillery salute by Royal Navy vessels, a lavish banquet, and even a staged jousting tournament. George Washington thinks that the British may have left their guard down during the festivities, so he dispatches the Marquis de Lafayette with around 2,500 men on a reconnaissance in force. And Lafayette is ordered to stay on the move, not to set up a permanent camp and generally try to disrupt British communications during the change in command. But Lafayette finds what he considers a perfect defensive position on a hill near the banks of the Schuylkill River. So he sets up a camp there and plans to use it as a base of operations to send out his little raids. Unbeknownst to Lafayette, British scouts have told General Howe, who you'll remember is still in command at this point, exactly where the American camp is located. Howe sends out a force of somewhere between 11,000 and 16,000 men in two columns to attack Lafayette's position in a pincher movement. When the first half of the pincher strikes, the colonial militia in that area just run away without notifying their commanders or Lafayette that they're under attack. So the arrival of British troops catches the young French commander by surprise and he is nearly captured. But he manages to escape and he steadies his troops and sets up an organized retreat. Militia, along with Oneida Native American allies, line up in the trees and rain down heavy fire on the advancing British to create the illusion of a larger American force and slow them down while Lafayette sneaks the main body of the army back to Valley Forge with the bulk of the troops using a Native American trail that the British are unaware of. Even the rear guard is ultimately able to escape with very few casualties, and Lafayette lives to fight another day. Amazingly for the number of troops involved, There are only a few killed, only three Americans and nine British in this action involving several thousand men. Following this last attempt to strike a blow at the Americans, General Howe is finally replaced by General Clinton. 
a more cautious man who carefully plans out his every move. In his book, Washington, the Indispensable Man, American historian James Thomas Flexner writes, quote, As soon as Clinton arrived from New York, the word was that Philadelphia would be evacuated. Washington waited eagerly for reports that the transports were being fitted for a long ocean voyage to the Indies or to Europe. But the Navy carried the Army's baggage to New York. The troops were clearly going to march there through the lowlands of New Jersey. In mid-June, the washerwomen, who were among Washington's most effective spies, reported that the British officials in Philadelphia had ordered their linen delivered at once, finished or unfinished. It followed that the march was about to start. Sure enough, on the 18th, the enemy force crossed the Delaware. Again, as when Boston was evacuated, there was the opportunity for a triumphal parade with the commander-in-chief at the head. Again, there was no such parade. Washington was busy trying to decide how to react to the British move. End quote. There's a good reason for Washington to be indecisive. On the face of it, pure military logic says to attack, attack now. Why wait? The British are in the process of withdrawal, and that makes them vulnerable. Their cannons are being wheeled away and aren't in position to fire. The men are focused on gathering their belongings and preparing to march. The sentries will be preoccupied. This is a golden opportunity to take a shot at the British Army and surprise attack them while they're preoccupied. Unfortunately, this opportunity comes with some risk. Maybe one of the British sentries is still sharp and warns his commanders about the incoming attack and it's the Americans who get caught with their pants down. Maybe a freshly trained American soldier sets his musket hammer to full cock before marching out and it goes off by accident, alerting the British. The fortunes of war are fickle. Anything could happen. And while normally you have to accept risk in warfare, it's part of the game, the Americans are at a delicate juncture. The French have signed on to the war, but haven't actually come to blows with the British yet. If the Americans suffer a disastrous defeat in the field... King Louis can still withdraw his support from the United States and write a letter to King George telling him, Just kidding, let's not go to war. Better for the Americans to hang back and just let the British leave Philadelphia of their own accord. What Washington decides to do instead is to trail the British back across New Jersey. The Americans will keep well behind the British Army and only engage them if a perfect opportunity arises. And I should mention that Washington isn't making all of these decisions himself. While he's ultimately the guy who calls the shots, he's known for conferring with his subcommanders, and in this case, most of them favor caution. The most cautious of these is Lieutenant General Charles Lee, who you may remember from last episode as the guy who the British captured in his bathrobe while he was in the middle of writing a letter criticizing Washington. Well, now the British have released him in a prisoner exchange. General Lee doesn't think the Americans should be fighting the British in the field at all and he finds Baron von Steuben's reforms ridiculous. Lee has even argued to Congress that the Continental Army should be abolished and that the United States should go back to a militia army, let the British have free reign where they want to, and engage in guerrilla warfare in the countryside while the French do all the heavy lifting. While Congress hasn't agreed to abolish the army, 
they have agreed to make Lee Washington's new second-in-command. During their march across New Jersey, the British are harassed by both the local New Jersey Brigade of the Continental Army and the New Jersey Militia, who make small hit-and-run attacks but otherwise let them pass. Despite the constant danger, General Clinton seems to be marching inordinately slowly. He seems to be baiting the Americans to attack. Even the head of the New Jersey militia tells George Washington as much, which makes him and his council of war even more leery. By June 24, 1778, the British are en route to Sandy Hook, a promontory in northern New Jersey from which the Royal Navy can ferry the troops over to New York. By this point, Washington's council of war is split roughly 50-50 between those who support attacking the British before they complete their retreat and those who favor hanging back. They argue for hours, and future U.S. President Alexander Hamilton, who at the time is a lieutenant colonel serving as George Washington's aide, says the top officers of the Continental Army, quote, would have done honor to the most honorable society of midwives, end quote. Charles Lee is strongly in favor of caution, though, and Washington ultimately mostly defers to his second-in-command and agrees to authorize sending a force of only 1,500 men forward to attack the British rearguard. That's only a fraction of the 10,600-strong Continental Army force Washington is leading, although it will be supported by the 1,200-strong New Jersey Brigade, along with a similar number of New Jersey militia, bringing the total strength to around 3,900. Washington first offers command of this force to General Lee, who turns it down because he thinks he's too high-ranking to command such a small force. So, Washington instead gives the command to the Marquis de Lafayette. Soon after this vanguard force is dispatched, some members of the more aggressive party of the War Council corner Washington outside his tent. These men, including Nathaniel Green, remind him that the army's job is to fight, and that a year of no fighting will be bad for morale, public perception, and recruitment. Yes, it would be a disaster to lose a major battle, but would it be any less disastrous for the Continental Army to sit on their hands and wait for the French to save them? That's not a good look for a country that claims to be independent. George Washington ultimately agrees and lets Brigadier General Anthony Wayne take another 1,000 picked men forward to join Lafayette. They catch up, but Lafayette is too aggressive and makes a mistake common for young officers. He outruns his supply lines. By the night of June 26th, he's three miles from the main British Army, which is encamped near Monmouth Courthouse in Monmouth County, New Jersey, when a message from Washington arrives ordering him to withdraw nine miles and wait for the main army to get closer. And... Let the New Jersey militia provide a screening force between him and the British. At this point, General Lee has figured out that the vanguard force has grown and is pretty substantial, so he changes his mind and asks Washington if he can take command after all. Washington agrees, and when the American Council of War meets on the night of June 27th, Lee is given free reign to plan his own attack. Unfortunately, he has no chance to survey the terrain or to make any sound plans. When his force arrives near the British rearguard at 8 a.m., they have to cross three small creeks, which makes Lee nervous about what will happen should they have to retreat. 
Firing commences not long afterwards when the Americans run into a small number of British grenadiers. But while they may be small in number, the British grenadiers are tough troops. They've been left to guard the British rear for a reason, and they put up a serious fight. This gives more British troops the opportunity to turn around from the main army and join the Grenadiers, and eventually the Americans are outnumbered. It's unclear what happens next. It appears that Lafayette orders some of his men to fall back a few dozen yards and trim their lines, but as these men are walking backwards, Other men in the vicinity think that Lafayette's men are retreating, so they turn around and start to run. And as this somewhat larger body of the army is running away, General Lee fears a disordered panic and what will happen to a panicking army trying to retreat across three creeks, and he orders a general withdrawal. Meanwhile... George Washington is marching the main body of the Continental Army towards the vanguard when he suddenly hears the gunfire come to a halt. Soon American soldiers appear, running the other direction in a disorderly retreat. Returning to James Thomas Flexner's account, quote, Leaving Green in command of his column, Washington charged ahead. Soon he saw, in front of more retreating regiments, a familiar scarecrow figure. Lee was chatting comfortably with his aides. Washington spurred over to him, asked, What is all this confusion for and retreat? Such was the commander-in-chief's angry vehemence that Lee was for the moment stunned. Finally, he entered into a confused rigmarole. He had received contradictory intelligence. His orders had been disobeyed. People had been impertinent. He had found himself in the most extensive plain in America, where such troops as he commanded would be helpless before the enemy horse. Furthermore, the whole maneuver had been contrary to his best judgment. Washington shouted, All this may be very true, sir, but you ought not to have undertaken it unless you intended to go through with it. End quote. Once again, Washington salvages a bad situation. He rallies enough of the remaining men to form up across the road with a couple of cannons to slow the British down, and he leaves them under the command of General Wayne. Then he rides back to the main army and has them form a larger line of battle and prepare to receive the British in a proper fight. He even manages to get the men who had retreated back into good order and ready to fight, but this all takes time, and by the time the main American army has been deployed, the advance force is now retreating down the road and the Redcoats are not far behind them. Finding the Americans already deployed, the British try to outflank the Continental Army first on the left and then on the right. But the Continentals stand their ground and fight like disciplined soldiers, and after the second flanking attempt, the Americans charge, and the outnumbered British are forced to retreat and join the rest of their army to sail back to New York City. The Battle of Monmouth isn't a major strategic victory, but it's a symbolic one. Not only have the Americans once again beaten a British force in the field, but somewhere around a thousand Germans have deserted the British in the process, uh, making it harder for the British to rely on their mercenary forces, since there's a little bit of distrust there now. This is a big win. Unfortunately for Charles Lee, Washington blames him for the fact that it wasn't an even bigger win. See, Lee is notoriously gregarious, and he's also an old-school gentleman soldier with a strong sense of pride. He's 
Unable to let things go and accept the blame for the vanguard's disorderly retreat, and this gets him into trouble. On June 30th, he writes a letter to George Washington that he erroneously dates July 1st. Quote, Sir, from the knowledge I have of your Excellency's character, I must conclude that nothing but the misinformation of some very stupid or misrepresentation of some very wicked person could have occasioned your making use of so very singular expressions as you did on my coming up to the ground where you had taken post. They implied that I was guilty either of disobedience of orders, of want of conduct, or want of courage. Your Excellency will therefore infinitely oblige me by letting me know on which of these three articles you ground your charge that I may prepare for my justification, which I have the happiness to be confident I can do to the Army, to the Congress, to America, and to the world in general. Your Excellency must give me leave to observe that neither yourself nor those about your person could from your situation be in the least judges of the merits or demerits of our measures. And to speak with a becoming pride... I can assert that to these maneuvers the success of the day was entirely owing. I can boldly say that had we remained on the first ground, or had we advanced, or had the retreat been conducted in a manner different from what it was, this whole army and the interests of America would have risked being sacrificed. I ever had, and hope ever shall have, the greatest respect and veneration for General Washington. I think him endowed with many great and good qualities. But in this instance, I must pronounce that he has been guilty of an act of cruel injustice towards a man who certainly has some pretensions to the regard of every servant of this country. And I think, sir, I have a right to demand some reparation for the injury committed. And unless I can obtain it, I must in justice to myself, when this campaign is closed, which I believe will close the war, retire from a service at the head of which is placed a man capable of offering such injuries. But at the same time, in justice to you, I must repeat that I from my soul believe that it was not a motion of your own breast, but instigated by some of those dirty earwigs who will forever insinuate themselves near persons in high office. For I really am convinced that when General Washington acts from himself... No man in his army will have reason to complain of injustice or indecorum. I am, sir, and hope I ever shall have reason to continue your most sincerely devoted humble servant, Charles Lee. End quote. George Washington responds, quote, Sir, I received your letter, dated through mistake the 1st of July, expressed as I conceive in terms highly improper. I am not conscious of having made use of any very singular expressions at the time of my meeting you, as you intimate. What I recollect to have said was dictated by duty and warranted by the occasion. As soon as circumstances will permit, you shall have an opportunity either of justifying yourself to the Army, to Congress, to America, and to the world in general or of convincing them that you were guilty of a breach of orders and of misbehavior before the enemy on the 28th in not attacking them as you had been directed and in making an unnecessary, disorderly, and shameful retreat. I am, sir, your most observant servant, George Washington. Lee then writes back with two letters, and it's telling that all of these letters are sent on June 30th between two men who are in the same camp. It's like they're two kids who aren't speaking to each other, so they're having their friends pass notes. Anyway, Lee's first letter reads, quote, Sir, I beg your excellency's pardon for the inaccuracy in misdating my letter. You cannot afford me greater pleasure than in giving me the opportunity of showing to America the sufficiency of her respective servants. I trust the temporary power of office and the tinsel dignity attending it will not be able, by all the mists they can raise, to obfuscate the bright rays of truth. In the meantime, Your Excellency can have no objection to my retiring from the army. I am, sir, your most observant, humble servant, Charles Lee. End quote. 
After giving things some thought, Lee writes his second response, quote, Sir, I have reflected on both your situation and mine, and beg leave to observe that it will be for our mutual convenience that a court of inquiry should be immediately ordered, but I could wish it might be a court-martial, for if the affair is drawn into length it may be difficult to collect the necessary evidences, and perhaps might bring on a paper war betwixt the adherents to both parties, which may occasion some disagreeable feuds on the continent, for all are not my friends, nor all your admirers. I must entreat, therefore, from your love of justice, that you will immediately exhibit your charge, and that on the first halt I may be brought to a trial. And am, sir, your most observant, humble servant, Charles Lee. End quote. Washington takes Lee up on his offer. In his final letter, he writes, quote, Sir, your letter by Colonel Fitzgerald and also one of this date have been duly received. I have sent Colonel Scammell, the adjutant general, to put you in arrest, who will deliver to you a copy of the charges on which you will be tried. I am, sir, your most observant servant, George Washington. End quote. Lee is ultimately brought up on charges of disobedience of orders and not attacking the enemy on the 28th of June, agreeable to repeated instructions, misbehavior before the enemy on the same day by making an unnecessary, disorderly, and shameful retreat, and disrespect to the commander-in-chief in two letters. The records of the court-martial show that the panel isn't sure about the first two charges. Lee was given complete command with discretion to make his own plans, and he didn't retreat until he was clearly outnumbered and outgunned. Courts martial aren't in the habit of condemning officers who make that kind of command decision. But the court does believe that Lee was disrespectful to his superior officer, so they decide to find him guilty on all three charges. His sentence is light, though. He's suspended from military service for a year. During his suspension, Lee only makes things worse for himself by continually pleading his innocence to anyone and everyone. Congress eventually expels him from the army after he annoys them with a series of letters, and he loses a duel to Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence one of George Washington's biggest fans. Lee dies in disgrace a few years later in 1782 and doesn't live to see the end of the war. Regardless of General Lee's alleged cowardice, the Americans have won the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse and the British have finished their retreat to New York with their tails between their legs. They'll be able to hold New York City until the end of the war. The big harbor, bristling with British warships, presents a daunting obstacle. But they won't be able to project power outside of New York, since so many troops have been diverted to the Caribbean and elsewhere. Furthermore, to ensure that the British can't easily strike inland if they change their minds, the Americans have fortified an area called West Point, about 50 miles up the Hudson River from New York. West Point is located in an S-shaped bend in the river, which allows artillery to cover a huge stretch of river from one relatively small location. Designed by Polish engineer Tedius Kociuszko, then serving as a brigadier general in the Continental Army, the fortifications will eventually be converted into the new United States Military Academy in 1802. From these fortifications, a thick, heavy chain is laid across the Hudson. So if the British attempt to sail north to Albany and run that stretch of river past West Point, not only will they be exposed to cannon fire for a good stretch of the river, but at the end of that stretch they'll get hung up on a chain where they'll be sitting ducks. 
As I said, the British army in New York never again leaves the city except on minor raids, so the chain and the West Point fortifications are never tested. Shortly after the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, in early July 1778, the French finally get involved in the war for real. This is when a French fleet sails into Delaware Bay in an attempt to bottle up the British in Philadelphia. When they learn that their intelligence is months out of date and the British have already retreated to New York, French commander Charles-Henri Hector de Estaing confers with the Americans to decide on the next target. Attacking New York is out of the question. It's too well defended, even for the combined strength of the Continental Army, Destang's 12 ships of the line, and the 4,000 French troops they carry with them. Instead, the French decide to sail about 160 miles further east and a little north to attack Newport, Rhode Island. Located between Boston and New York, Newport is the only city in the United States other than New York to be in the hands of British troops at this time. The natural harbor there is almost as good as New York's, and while the lack of access to major rivers and inland trade has kept it from growing anywhere as large as New York, Newport is still a fantastic place to base a fleet, and Rhode Island known today as Aquidneck Island, to distinguish it from the mainland part of the state of Rhode Island, has enough room to garrison thousands of troops. Within two days, a British force based in Newport could reach as far south as Philadelphia. George Washington has already recognized the importance of Newport, and has ordered Major General John Sullivan to raise an army of 5,000 troops. Sullivan has been on the Rhode Island mainland since May, observing the British positions and trying to lay the logistical groundwork for a siege. But his force has only around 1,600 men in total so the British are able to keep sending small raids to steal his supplies and ruin his defenses. He's already been trying to recruit men, and Washington's order doesn't change anything. What does change is the arrival of reinforcements Washington has sent under the command of the Marquis de Lafayette. A few days later, on July 27, 1778, Washington sends reliable Nathaniel Green to act as an advisor to Sullivan, along with a letter urging Sullivan to take Green's advice. And, as so often happens in the American Revolution, when word gets out that there's going to be a big battle, militia begin trickling in not just from the rest of Rhode Island, but from surrounding states, eager to get in on the action. On the British side, Henry Clinton has sent reinforcements to Newport already, bolstering the defenders' strength to around 6,700 men. The French fleet arrives near Newport two days after General Green, and on July 29th, Sullivan, Green, Lafayette, and de Estaing all confer, and they agree that the Americans will attack Newport from the north part of Rhode Island, where Sullivan has already been preparing defenses. The French troops will deploy on Connecticut Island, which sits to the west of Rhode Island, between it and the mainland. This will prevent the British from making an easy escape, and hopefully allow the Franco-American force to capture an entire British army, repeating the events at Saratoga. Meanwhile, the French fleet will remain offshore in the harbor to prevent the defenders from resupplying or escaping by sea. What follows is the story of two battles, one on the land and one on the sea. On the land, the story is pretty boring. 
The British man their posts and hope for aid, while the Americans keep digging trenches, getting closer and closer to the walls. But the battle is decided at sea. On August 9th, British Admiral Richard Howe arrives off Newport with eight ships of the line. This puts the French in a difficult position. Sooner or later, they're going to want to leave Newport Harbor and go somewhere else, and when they do, Howe's ships of the line will be waiting for them. Right now, the French have a clear numerical advantage, but for how much longer? If Howe is allowed to just sit there, he can send for more British ships, and the French fleet will be outnumbered. So, D'Estaing recalls his men from Connecticut Island to serve as marines on his ships and sails out to meet the British task force on August 10th. We'll never know how this showdown would have gone, because as the two fleets are still deploying in their lines of battle, dark clouds blow in, and a violent storm turns everyone's thoughts from battle to mere survival. Both fleets are scattered to the winds, with each ship riding out the nor'easter as best it can. The French fleet eventually regroups hundreds of miles southwest off the coast of Delaware, while the British are able to regroup in New York. Several of D'Estaing's ships are badly damaged. His flagship not only lost a mast in the storm, but has been severely damaged by a British ship it randomly encountered. With no intelligence on the condition of the British fleet, he has no choice but to sail to Boston and make repairs, but not before stopping off at Newport on the way to let the Americans know what's going on. When the French fleet and its 4,000 troops leave for good on August 22, 1778, American morale takes a serious blow. The militia who have joined the siege mostly trickle back to their homes. At the same time, General Clinton is about to dispatch another relief force from New York, which would be a serious threat to Sullivan's now depleted army. With no choice, Sullivan retreats from Rhode Island. On August 28th, when most of the American force has already been evacuated, the British launch two abortive assaults, first on one side of the island and then on the other. The second attack is supported by gunboats firing from offshore. But the casualties on both sides are relatively light with only a little over 30 men killed on each side and around 200 total casualties for the Americans and 250 for the British. This first attempt at a joint Franco-American battle has been less than inspiring. After the battle, General Sullivan co-authors a letter with his general staff, angrily deriding the French retreat. Among other things, it states that the retreat was, quote, "...derogatory to the honor of France, contrary to the intentions of His Most Christian Majesty in the interest of his nation, and destructive in the highest degree to the welfare of the United States of America, and highly injurious to the alliance formed between the two nations." End quote. Thankfully, cooler heads prevail. George Washington and Congress assure Destang that they understand his decision, and on the other side of the Atlantic, Ben Franklin continues to charm just about everyone in King Louis's court, so there is no damage done to the Franco-American alliance. I mention John Sullivan's angry letter mostly to illustrate that he's a bit of a hothead, because he's going to appear again in our story. As it turns out, D'Estaing's decision to retreat to Boston was indeed the correct one. Almost as soon as his fleet had left France, 
a British fleet of 13 ships of the line commanded by Vice Admiral John Byron had been tailing him, although this fleet had been severely delayed by bad weather. Had de Estang not first attacked the British fleet off of Newport and then retreated from there, his fleet almost certainly would have been lost. As it stands, John Byron takes over from Richard Howe as commander of the British North American fleet, and in September he tries to attack the French fleet in Boston. But another storm blows in, and Byron's fleet gets scattered while Destangs is safe in port, and then when the storm is over, Destang is able to sail his now-repaired fleet out of the harbor and south to the Caribbean. The British will hold on to Newport, Rhode Island for another year before abandoning it in 1779. In 1780, Newport will ironically become the French headquarters in North America and will remain so for the rest of the war. So, things are looking good for the French and the Americans alike on the North American continent. Unfortunately for the French, the British pivot to the Caribbean has paid off, and Estang's twelve ships of the line are badly needed to protect the French colonies. Rewinding a little bit to July, the French naval war against the British hasn't been going well. In July of 1778, a French fleet under the command of Louis Guilouet, the Comte d'Orvilliers, sails out of Brest, a major French port on the Atlantic coast. This fleet consists of 30 ships of the line, along with a large number of smaller ships. At this time, the British fleet under John Byron has just left pursuing Destang's fleet to America. So, the French know that the British Channel fleet has been weakened, and Dorvilliers has been ordered to try and bait the British fleet out and see if they can get the measure of them. Meanwhile, the British fleet under Augustus Keppel has 29 ships of the line, so the two sides are about equal. Dorvilliers decides to engage the British Channel fleet at a place called Ouchon, which is a stretch of ocean off the French coast, south of the English Channel. The battle is a debacle for both sides, for a number of reasons. For one thing, the officers on both sides lack experience. Neither the French nor the British navies have been engaged in full-sized fleet-on-fleet action since the Seven Years' War. That's 15 years ago. All but the senior officers have only ever been involved in peacetime anti-piracy patrols, and those senior officers were junior officers in the last war. They're not used to coordinating with multiple other ships. At points in the battle, both sides will have an opportunity to finish the other side off, but won't be able to because individual ships are slow to respond to orders and unsure of where and how to form up in the line of battle. In addition to that, the wind does not help matters. It changes more than once during the course of the fight, which is a big deal in the age of sail. French commander d'Orvilliers only attacks to begin with because he has the wind at his back. And when it changes, he runs into trouble. Then later on, as the two fleets are readjusting, the wind changes back again. And the end result of all this is two badly damaged fleets that have to return to their respective ports for repair. Careers are ended on both sides in the high command. But while in the tactical sense the Battle of Ushant is a draw, in the strategic sense it's a British victory. British trade goes on unhindered and the English Channel remains safe. The French have 
30 ships of the line stuck in Europe getting refitted when they're more urgently needed in the Caribbean. Remember, this English Channel fleet wasn't going anywhere anyway. This French fleet could have been useful, and instead it's not. Despite this, in September of 1778, the French strike first by taking over the island of Dominica in the Western Caribbean. Now, this is not the modern-day Dominican Republic, which is a country that occupies half of a much larger island. This is a tiny island in the far Western Caribbean in an arc of islands called the Windward Islands. The French take Dominica with a force of 2,000 men who are opposed by only around 100 regular British troops and around 500 local militia. Soon after, the British attack the nearby sugar-producing French colony of St. Lucia on December 13th with a force of 5,000 men led by Rear Admiral Samuel Barrington. These are the 5,000 men that the British have redeployed from New York to the Caribbean. And along with seven ships of the line, they're going to siege this tiny island into submission. The ships quickly block up the tiny harbor at the north end of the island, well, near the north end, while 2,000 troops occupy the harbor facilities and Another 1,400 occupy the higher ground further inland and surround the small French garrison, which is able to do nothing but huddle behind their defenses and wait for help. Help is not long in coming. A mere day later, on December 14th, the Comte d'Estaing arrives with the 12 ships of the line he sailed down from Boston, along with 7,000 French troops. He's picked up more along the way. At first, he tries to force his way into the harbor with his superior numbers. But the British line their seven ships up across the entrance to the harbor, and the wind is against the French, so... D'Estaing is unable to sail his ships close enough to the British fleet to actually land any shots on them. After making two passes along the British line, he instead goes a little ways north to a place called Viggy Beach, which is really at the north end of the island, and there he tries an amphibious assault. But while St. Lucia is less than 10 miles across, it's... A tiny island, which makes it sound easy to take over, but it's a volcanic island, which means that it's mountainous, and the British have already occupied all of that high ground. After making multiple uphill assaults at the cost of 850 casualties, the Estang evacuates to the French base at Martinique on December 29th. A day later, on December 30th, the remaining French garrison on St. Lucia surrenders, and the island falls into British hands. The French have opened the war by fighting an indecisive naval battle that might as well be a strategic loss, and by swapping a pair of islands with the British in the Caribbean. This is a trend to watch as the American Revolution progresses, because remember that the American and French revolutions are linked. While the French succeed in tying up British men, ships, and resources, and helping the Americans win, they don't really gain anything for themselves, and they're going into all kinds of debt to do this. And this will become an issue for France when it comes time to make peace, and it's ultimately one of the triggers for the French Revolution, so just keep it in the back of your mind for now. Before we move on, I want to talk about what's going on in the West. So far, most of the fighting in North America has been near the coast, which makes sense. That's where most of the colonists live, it's where all the major settlements are, and it's also where the British have direct access. 
The British also have some small outposts in what's called the Northwest Territory. This is a large area that encompasses modern-day Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and eastern Minnesota. Basically, huge parts of the modern-day Rust Belt and Upper Midwest. And this whole area is, at least on paper, in British hands. In practice, there are only a few hundred British troops and a few thousand European people in the whole area. Most of it is de facto Native American territory. Up until this point, most of the Native Americans in North America have been neutral between the British and the American colonists, unwilling to get involved in what they see as a white man's war. Better for them just to sit on the sidelines and watch the British and the Americans beat each other up. They stand little to gain by joining the war, but choosing sides could be a disaster if the side they choose loses the war. Well, the British are aiming to change that, and to get some of the Native Americans on board, the British Lieutenant Governor of the Northwest Territory, an Irishman named Henry Hamilton, starts giving weapons and just general trade goods away for free to the Shawnee, Ottawa, and Lenape tribes in exchange for them launching raids on American frontier settlements. It's worth noting that this idea of encouraging random acts of violence isn't Hamilton's idea. He seems to be a humanist. This is a guy who spends weeks at a time living in Native American villages and paints hundreds of portraits of them. He's not the kind of guy to instigate uh, random violence, and even some of the more aggressive British officers in the Northwest Territory are squeamish about encouraging Native American raids. After all, there are loyalist colonists on the frontier too, and Indian raiders aren't going to ask about people's politics before attacking them. But orders from London are clear. Do whatever is necessary to get the natives to attack the western colonies and draw off some American military strength. And sure enough, when the British gift the Native Americans weapons and tell them to take whatever they want from the colonists, the British soldiers won't interfere, intense raiding begins to flare up. Now, to be clear, this is only individual local tribes joining the British, uh, not entire tribal confederations at this time, but that will change soon enough. The Americans, for example, have made a bargain with the Lenape to allow their troops free passage to attack the British fort at Detroit. And when that deal falls apart, the entire Lenape Confederation will jump over to the British side officially. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. For now, we're talking about small-scale frontier raiding. But keep in mind that even these little raids are just awful. We're talking about entire families killed and scalped with their houses burned down. That kind of sight starts to become routine on the western frontier. A young Virginia militiaman named George Rogers Clark aims to put a stop to this. Just 26 years old, Clark is furious about the raiding in Kentucky, which will one day become its own state, but which at the time is just Virginia's western frontier territory. He petitions the governor of Virginia, who allows him to raise up to 350 militia, and to retaliate for the raids. Now keep in mind, these are not Continental Army troops, these are just militia, and Clark has to raise them himself. And... He's only able to raise about 175 men. The Kentucky Territory is sparsely populated, and his recruiters have to compete with recruiters from the Continental Army and other local militias. Well, rather than go after the Native Americans, Clark decides to go directly for the source of the problem and attack the British. <laughs> 
and on July 4th, 1778, he attacks the British garrison at Kaskaskia, a modern-day town in southern Illinois, and captures it without firing a shot. What follows is a series of raids throughout the Northwest Territory that don't really merit a blow-by-blow account. Uh, One conquest of Clark's that I will mention is the Fort of Vincennes, which is located in modern-day southern Indiana. And that one is important because the British under Henry Hamilton ultimately take this fort back in December of 1778. Clark is unwilling to let this go, and he decides to do whatever it takes to retake Fort Vincennes. In February of 1779, after going deep into debt to pay his men to re-up their enlistments, George Rogers Clark leads them from Cascasia to Vincennes, marching in the ice, snow, and bone-chilling wind that Midwestern winters are known for. There, Clark's men surround the small garrison and negotiate an unconditional surrender. Fearing that the British might try some trickery to get out of their surrender, Clark orders his men to engage in some trickery and extreme brutality of their own as a show of force. I will let him describe it in his own words. Quote, While the conference was being held, a party of about 20 warriors who had been sent to the falls of the Ohio for scalps and prisoners were discovered returning. As no firing was going on at the time, they entered the plain near the town. They had no suspicion of the presence of an enemy. Captain John Williams was ordered to go out to meet them. The Indians, supposing it to be a party of their friends who had come to welcome them, gave the scalp and war whoop and came on with all their parade of successful warriors. William's party conducted itself in like fashion. Coming closer, the Indians fired a volley in the air, to which Captain Williams replied in kind. When they were within a few steps of each other, the chief stopped as if suspicious of something wrong. Captain Williams immediately seized him, whereupon the others, perceiving their mistake, turned in flight. Fifteen of them were killed or captured, however. Two British partisans attached to their party were killed, and two men who proved to be American prisoners in their hands were released. The Indians who had been taken by the soldiers were tomahawked and their bodies thrown into the river. We afterward learned that but one man of the entire party ever returned to his tribe, so that in all, seventeen must have been destroyed by us. We knew that nearly all of them were badly wounded, but as we had an enemy of more importance than they were to contend with, we could spare no time for pursuit, and Captain Williams allowed his men but a few minutes for executing the business before recalling them. Under these circumstances, those Indians who were not killed or taken immediately got off. End quote. George Rogers Clark plans to march on to Detroit and continues trying to prepare an expedition almost until the end of the war, but he's come about as far as his little 170-man militia can take him, and he's left stewing in southern Indiana and Illinois for the remainder of the conflict. Even so, his expedition is important for one major reason, and that's the question of American expansion beyond the western frontier. Clark has effectively established an American claim on land as far west as Illinois. During the Revolutionary War, Virginia even creates the short-lived Illinois Department, a government office to oversee its new western territory, although, given the potential for violence in the area, almost nobody actually settles there during the war. During post-war negotiations, this western military presence will help American negotiators convince the British to cede the Northwest Territory 
effectively establishing the Great Lakes as the boundary between the United States and Canada. Without George Rogers Clark, the 26-year-old militiaman, the U.S. may never have expanded as far as the Mississippi River, never mind the Pacific Coast. Further north, in western Pennsylvania and New York, Native Americans are also being forced to choose sides. In one of the great tragedies of the war, the American Revolution has torn the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, better known as the Iroquois Confederacy, in two. This is a people to whom unity is sacred, Politics have ripped them apart. The breach is only possible because for them, the politics of the American Revolution is a matter of life or death of their society. Back in 1768, the Iroquois and the British had concluded the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. This treaty established a formal boundary line between the British colonies and sovereign Iroquois land, a squiggly border that runs roughly north to south across central New York State, then southwest across Pennsylvania until it meets and follows the Ohio River as far west as Illinois. For the British... This is mostly about ensuring that their colonies don't get too powerful and that the crown itself remains on good terms with the Native Americans. But from an Iroquois perspective, it makes the British natural allies. The colonists want to expand into the American interior. One of the grievances the colonists have laid out against the Crown and the Declaration of Independence is specifically about the British government refusing to protect American colonists who settle on the wrong side of this boundary line. So if a colonial victory means that you in turn are going to get colonized, you want to help King George stay in power. At the same time, there is also a good argument for the Iroquois to join the American side, and that's the other side of the same coin. What if the colonists win their independence and the Iroquois have allied with the British? If the Iroquois are known as British allies, things will not go well for them when the white men stop fighting each other. No amount of Iroquois diplomacy will stop the Americans from taking their land and settling it. If, on the other hand, the Iroquois are known as American allies, they may keep their land. After all, while many colonists favor displacing the Iroquois and talk about it openly, there are many American colonists who are happy to live side by side and trade with each other for mutual benefit. An Iroquois-American alliance during the Revolutionary War could lay the groundwork for that kind of cooperative relationship later on. The split occurs in 1777, when the Seneca, Cayuga, Mohawk, and Onondaga tribes abandon neutrality and officially side with the British, while the Oneida and Tuscarora tribes side with the Americans. The pro-British faction is led by a man named Joseph Brandt, a Mohawk war chief who has risen to prominence not due to any family connections, but due to his education and intelligence. He is personally a close British ally, as evidenced by the fact that he's known to history by his English name and not his Mohawk name. And while he's unconnected inside the Iroquois Confederacy, his sister, Molly Brandt, is married to Sir William Johnson, an Irishman who has acted in the past as a liaison between the British Crown and the Iroquois. Perhaps most importantly, Joseph Brandt has experience with frontier warfare. He's fought with the British against the French in the Seven Years' War and against other Native American tribes during Pontiac's rebellion. Now, to be fair, 
Brent himself is a bit of a legend, even in his own time. He's only one of a handful of major war chiefs, but because of his unique reputation, any Iroquois frontier raids during the American Revolution end up being attributed to the man who the colonials call Monster Brandt. While Brandt is often accused of atrocities, and atrocities will occur, the historical record doesn't show that Brandt himself is personally responsible for any of them. Take, for example, the Battle of Wyoming, which takes place on July 3, 1778, in the Wyoming Valley of northeastern Pennsylvania, not far from the modern-day city of Wilkesbury, in an area that's right on the frontier. In that battle, a joint Loyalist and Native American army assaults an American fort, then pretends to retreat. Most of the men lie down and hide in a field with woods to either side, and some of the Native American troops hide in those trees off to the side. When the American militia sallies out of their fort to pursue the British and Native Americans, they walk right into the field where their enemies are hiding. The British loyalists and their Indian allies suddenly stand up and fire on the Americans at point-blank range, while the other Native Americans from the trees rush out to completely surround them. Only about 60 of the 370 Americans manage to escape, and more than 300 are killed and scalped. The Loyalists only take five prisoners, and given the number of killed, you would expect a lot more than that. In a normal engagement, there are more wounded than dead, so this is really good evidence that you've had a massacre. These Americans are patriot militia, not Spartan warriors. In a last stand type situation, they're going to surrender, so it's safe to say that the British-allied Iroquois commit an atrocity in the Battle of Wyoming, and that's before you consider the more than 1,000 houses burned after the battle during the sack of the valley. But let's be fair. Joseph Brandt is nowhere near the Battle of Wyoming, and as for the 1,000 burned houses, they are destroyed by the order of John Butler, the commander of the British no Loyalist Militia not by any Iroquois war chief. This type of border warfare serves the same purpose as the Native American raids in the West. It's part of a British strategy to draw off valuable resources from the Continental Army at nearly zero cost to the British. In this case, the British are promising the Iroquois that they'll continue to abide by the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, which should be a given since King George III himself agreed to that treaty in the first place. That's a very low price to pay. The Loyalist militia are also fighting for free. By this point in the war, it's not purely a political question for them. Congress and individual state assemblies are discussing the idea of seizing the property of Loyalist citizens to pay off American war debts. So, if you are known as a Loyalist in late 1778, early 1779, you are already at risk of losing all your worldly possessions if the Patriots win. It's a pretty powerful incentive to fight. Over the course of late 1778, the frontier war in New York and Pennsylvania continues to heat up. On September 17th, a combined force of around 400 Iroquois and Loyalist militia attacked the Patriot-held fort at German Flats, New York, another frontier settlement. Thanks to good intelligence... American commander Colonel Peter Bellinger has gotten most of the people from the surrounding farms inside the fort. The Iroquois and Loyalists don't have any cannons to attack the walls, so they instead burn the people's crops and drive off or kill all the livestock in the valley. Joseph Brandt is in command here, but 
Destroying food stocks is a standard part of warfare at the time, not an atrocity. And only three civilians are killed in the raiding, which, while hardly an optimal outcome, does not constitute a massacre. In response to the raid at German Flats, the governor of New York formally calls on George Washington for aid. Washington, in turn, dispatches Lieutenant Colonel William Butler with a little over 250 men to launch a retaliatory raid against the Iroquois. These men attack the Iroquois villages of Onanquaga and Unadilla in upstate New York. Like the Americans at German Flats, the Iroquois have gotten good intelligence, and the villages have been evacuated before Butler's men arrive at Onanquaga on October 8th. And, like the British loyalists and Indians at German Flats, the Americans burn Onaquaga and Unadilla to the ground, destroy their food stores, and generally wipe the villages off the map. After this, they go home, and the whole expedition is over by October 16th. Shortly afterwards, many of Joseph Brandt's men return home to these villages, only to find them destroyed. These villages specifically belong to the Seneca tribe, and the Seneca warriors who used to live there are angry. Their homes have burned down. Their families are living on charity in neighboring villages, and they want revenge. On November 11, 1778, Another joint Loyalist Iroquois force attacks another American frontier defense, the small fort at Cherry Valley, New York. Once again, they don't have the artillery to punch through the fort's walls, and the 300 defenders are a strong deterrent in their own right. But the fort's commander, Ichabod Alden, has foolishly set up his headquarters almost a quarter mile outside the fort at the house of a local settler. When the Iroquois attack, they open with a group of Seneca warriors surrounding the house. And when those warriors are done killing all of the soldiers in the house, including Alden, the Seneca slaughter all of the civilians before going on a rampage through the surrounding area, breaking into houses and killing settlers. Around 30 civilians are killed in what comes to be known as the Cherry Valley Massacre. It's worth noting that Joseph Brandt is recorded as running amongst his men and begging them to stop, so this seems to be a case of angry, disorderly troops resorting to mob violence, more than a case of any kind of deliberate war crime on the part of leadership. Well, regardless of whether or not Brandt himself is culpable, the Cherry Valley Massacre demands a response. None like the Native American raids in the West, which only draw a response from local militia, the British strategy further north seems to have worked. George Washington is going to have to dispatch a serious body of troops, not just a few hundred men, to deal with the Iroquois. At the same time, for reasons we'll discuss in a minute, the British have removed even more troops from New York City, which means that... Washington's encircling army can now spare some men for just such an expedition. He's able to come up with about 4,000 troops, and he puts them under the command of Major General John Sullivan, who you may remember as the hot-headed officer who wrote an angry missive about the French retreat at the Siege of Newport. Well, now Sullivan is getting the chance to wipe the Iroquois off the map at least those who are allied with the British. In a letter dated May 31, 1779, George Washington writes out Sullivan's orders in detail. I've lightly edited this because some of it is just operational minutiae that would be boring, but here's most of the letter. Quote, the expedition you were appointed to command is to be directed against the hostile tribes of the Six Nations of Indians, with their associates and adherents. The immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements, 
and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops now in the ground and prevent their planting more. You will establish such intermediate posts as you think necessary for the security of your communication and convoys. Nor need I caution you, while you leave a sufficiency of men for their defense to take care to diminish your operating force as little as possible. I would recommend that some post in the center of the Indian country should be occupied with all expedition, with a sufficient quantity of provision whence parties should be detached to lay waste all the settlements around with instructions to do it in the most effectual manner, that the country may not be merely overrun, but destroyed. I beg leave to suggest as general rules that ought to govern your operations, to make rather than receive attacks, attend with as much impetuosity, shouting and noise as possible, and to make the troops act in as loose and dispersed a way as is consistent with a proper degree of government concert and mutual support. It should be previously impressed upon the minds of the men wherever they have an opportunity to rush on with the war whoop and fixed bayonet. Nothing will disconcert and terrify the Indians more than this. I need not urge the necessity of using every method in your power to gain intelligence of the enemy's strength, motions, and designs. Nor need I suggest the extraordinary degree of vigilance and caution which will be necessary to guard against surprises from an adversary so secret, desultory, and rapid as the Indians. After you have very thoroughly completed the destruction of their settlements, if the Indians should show a disposition for peace, I would have you to encourage it, on condition that they will give some decisive evidence of their sincerity by delivering up some of the principal instigators of their past hostility into our hands. Butler, Brant, and the most mischievous of the Tories that have joined them, or any other that they may have in their power that we are interested to get into ours. They may possibly be engaged by address, secrecy, and stratagem, to surprise the garrison of Niagara and the shipping on the lakes, and put them into our possession. This may be demanded as a condition of our friendship and would be a most important point gained. If they can render a service of this kind, you may stipulate to assist them in their distress with supplies of provisions and other articles of which they will stand in need, having regard in the expectations you give them to our real abilities to perform. I have no power at present to authorize you to conclude a treaty of peace with them, but you may agree upon the terms of one letting them know that it must be finally ratified by Congress and giving them every proper assurance that it will. I shall write to Congress on the subject and endeavor to obtain more ample and definitive authority. But you will not by any means listen to any overture of peace before the total ruin of their settlements is effected. It is likely enough their fears, if they are unable to oppose us, will compel them to offers of peace or policy may lead them to endeavor to amuse us in this way to gain time and succor for more effectual opposition. Our future security will be in their inability to injure us, the distance to which they are driven, and in the terror with which the severity of the chastisement they receive will inspire them. Peace without this would be fallacious and temporary. New presence and an addition of force from the enemy would engage them to break it the first fair opportunity, and all the expense of our extensive preparations would be lost. Relying perfectly upon your judgment, prudence, and activity, I have the highest expectation of success equal to our wishes, and I beg leave to assure you that I anticipate with great pleasure the honor which will redound to yourself and the advantage to the common cause from a happy termination of this important enterprise. End quote. The following campaign, which comes to be known as the Sullivan Expedition, can only be described as an attempted genocide. According to Major General Sullivan himself, no fewer than 40 Iroquois villages are destroyed. If the inhabitants haven't fled by the time Sullivan's men arrive, they're put to the bayonet, even children sleeping in their beds. This is bloody, nasty work, and 
Sullivan spends much of his budget on rum to keep the men drunk so they don't have to think too hard about what they're doing. And as for the Oneida and Tuscarora guides, the American allied Iroquois who are marching ahead of Sullivan's army, showing them where and whom to kill, well, they are also good and drunk much of the time. There's only one actual battle in the campaign, and that's on August 29, 1779, near the modern-day town of Elmira in south-central New York State. John Sullivan has established some defensive positions during his march, and after leaving garrisons behind, he has around 3,200 men remaining in his army, against a joint Loyalist Native American army of around 500 to 600 men including Joseph Brandt and his Iroquois. Sullivan actually has the opportunity to surround and annihilate this army, but part of his force is advancing through a swamp, so they get delayed and the British Allied force is able to escape with few casualties. It's a tactical victory for them, since Brandt and his men live to fight another day, but... It leaves Sullivan's men free to raid for the remainder of the summer, completing the devastation of the Iroquois in central New York. The destruction is so complete that the Iroquois give George Washington a new name, Canadicarius, which means town destroyer. By the time Sullivan returns to Washington's main army in early October, more than 5,000 Iroquois have been displaced, with an unknown number killed. This eliminates them from the strategic playing field, and even puts a drain on the British. Hungry Iroquois refugees flood British-occupied territories, and the Crown is forced to provide food for them, and even to set aside a large tract of land in Canada for them to move to. This partial genocide of the Iroquois people represents the dark side of nationalism. The idea that it's okay to do just about anything to other people if it's going to help your side win. And in the long term, both the Iroquois siding with the British and the Sullivan expedition poison the relationship between the Iroquois Confederacy and the young United States. Most Iroquois will be forced out of New York State in the years after the Revolution, with their land being given to American War veterans. These Iroquois would settle in Canada, as well as further west in lands that would eventually become American states. A handful remain in New York. I live not far from the Onondaga Nation, which, while small, is sovereign tribal territory within the state of New York, but the Iroquois as an independent nation-state that's drawn on world maps, that's gone. As I mentioned, the British have been pulling troops out of New York, and that's not just to defend the Caribbean. In late 1778, they've been shifting to what they call the Southern Strategy. One problem the British have been dealing with throughout this war is the massive size of the 13 colonies. The United States, as it stands in 1778, has a land area of more than 140,000 square miles. That's more than half again as large as Great Britain, which has an area of a touch over 80,000 square miles. A lot of this American land is in the South, which has been relatively quiet compared to the rambunctious, rebellious North. The British plan is now to focus on the South, crush the revolution there where the job will be relatively easy, and then focus on the North later. With half of the colonies pacified and fewer square miles for the Continental Army to potentially roam around in, the young United States should become much easier to crush. 
Meanwhile, ships and troops based in the south will be closer to the Caribbean, so British forces in the two theaters can at least provide a little bit of support to each other. Things will start out promisingly for the British, but there's one major problem. They're forgetting how quickly they got booted out of the South at the beginning of the war. The only reason it's been so quiet down there is that the British have been fighting over northern cities like New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. Once they start attacking cities in the South, the Americans will shift their efforts there. Another reason the British are shifting to the South is that just as there are fewer patriots there, there are also more loyalists. There's been some talk in Congress about liberty for all and ending the slave trade, and to be honest, this talk really has no chance of going anywhere. As I said in one of the earlier episodes, most of the U.S. states at this time have slavery on some level. For example, uh, Rhode Island has a huge slave population for its size. But nonetheless, uh, within the southern landholding, slaveholding class, uh, there is some fear that uh, should the U.S. break away from Great Britain, the slave trade will be banned. So a lot of slaveholders are firmly in the loyalist camp. But Relying on these guys proves to be another example of botched planning on the British part, uh, since the British also intend on offering freedom to slaves in exchange for them fighting against the rebels. Well, if the British do that, they'll lose the support of the slaveholders. It's not a clear, cogent plan, and this is the kind of thinking you get when your wars are planned by committee, which, if we're being honest, most modern wars, including this one, are. Anyway, I'm going to kind of breeze through the first portion of the Southern campaign, because most of it is the same kind of military back and forth that we've seen between the British and the Americans a lot already, and I don't want to get bogged down with more of the same. On December 29, 1778, between 2,500 and 3,600 British, German, and Loyalist troops under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Campbell launch a surprise attack on the city of Savannah, Georgia. At the time, the city is only defended by around 900 American army and militia under Major General Robert Howe. No relation to the British General Howe. A larger relief army led by Major General Benjamin Lincoln is on the way from South Carolina, but it has yet to arrive. So Howe's goal is to hold out long enough for Lincoln to reinforce him and drive the British back. When the British land their troops about two miles south of Savannah, he deploys his men between them and the city in an upside-down V formation, with the flanks anchored by heavy wooded swamps. Howe's idea is that if the British march into the V, they'll be taking fire from both sides. And, well, they can't go around the outside of the V, they can't outflank the Americans because of the swamps. At least... They shouldn't be able to, but as you can imagine, the local slaves have little loyalty to any cause other than their own potential freedom, and one of these men goes to the British and shows Lieutenant Colonel Campbell a hidden Native American path through the swamp on the American right flank. The British are able to sneak a few hundred men around behind the Americans unnoticed. And these guys start firing their guns and causing a commotion at the American barracks just as the main British force charges from the front. The Americans have nowhere to run but back to Savannah where they are quickly surrounded. At the end of the day, 
more than half the Americans are captured, with over 80 killed, many of whom drown while trying to flee through the swamp. By comparison, Lieutenant Colonel Campbell loses only seven dead and 17 wounded. This smashing victory leaves Savannah firmly in British hands and gives them a foothold on the American South. Campbell will march his men inland to Augusta, while Brigadier General Augustin Prevost, a Swiss commander who's been running the show in British Florida all this time, uh, he sets up headquarters in Savannah and takes overall command in the south. Prevost plans to rely mostly on local militia to pacify the South, and soon a force of 700 loyalists is marching to Augusta to meet up with Campbell's men. On February 12, 1779, 400 Patriot militia intercept these loyalists and attack them from high ground, killing the Loyalist commander along with dozens of his men and capturing around 75 more. The British will soon turn the tables on the Americans. A thousand South Carolina militia have marched south into Georgia to reinforce the local Georgia militia, which forces Lieutenant Colonel Campbell to withdraw his force from Augusta and march back to Savannah. During his withdrawal, Campbell has to hop on a riverboat to catch a ship back to Britain for political reasons, so he hands over his command to Marcus Prevost, who is Brigadier General Prevost's younger brother. On March 3rd, Marcus engages the South Carolina militia with his relatively small number of regular troops, cavalry, and grenadiers, and utterly annihilates the amateur soldiers. The older Prevost brother then takes the entire British force north to try and take over the city of Charleston, South Carolina, which is much larger with a much more substantial port than Savannah's. But Prevost is turned back when Benjamin Lincoln reinforces Charleston with enough men to outnumber the British. So Prevost retreats to Savannah and Lincoln pursues him, along with naval support from our friend, the French naval commander, the Comte d'Estaing. The siege, which begins on September 19, 1779, is a disaster for the Americans. While the British only have a few ships, they scuttle some of the small fleet they do have to block a narrow channel that gives access to the city proper. Basically, they prevent the French fleet from getting close enough to bombard Savannah with any accuracy. American commander Benjamin Lincoln presses for a traditional siege. He wants to starve the British out, but a siege will only be effective for as long as the French ships can stick around to block the harbor. The Estang points out that winter is fast approaching and there's a good chance that he'll be recalled to the Caribbean, and he pushes for an all-out assault. He's not just going to sit back and watch, either. He commits nearly 4,000 French troops to the attack, which is to take place on the morning of October 9th. But half of these troops end up getting lost in a morning fog, and they only attack after daybreak. Worse, the spot they're attacking is believed to be a soft spot on the British line, defended only by militia. This position is in fact defended by hardened Scottish Highlanders who put up a stiff defense. At first... The French and American attack is nonetheless successful, and it pushes the British back from one trench to another to another. The British have dug seven rows of trenches here. But as the French and the Americans take over part of one trench and try to secure it, the British will retake part of another trench and kill a bunch of guys. <laughs> 
the fighting is some of the most brutal of the Revolutionary War. Looks almost like World War I in places. D'Astang is wounded twice. Kazimierz Pulaski, a Polish officer who has commanded American cavalry throughout the war, is killed. And after a little more than an hour's fighting, D'Estaing calls off the attack. On October 17th, the French admiral would sail away, leaving General Lincoln with no choice but to abandon the siege of Savannah and retreat back north to Charleston again. At this point, Brigadier General Augustine Prevost is about to be relieved by Sir Henry Clinton himself, commander of the North American Army, along with his second-in-command, Charles Cornwallis, and over 8,000 troops from New York. With this force, the British intend to take Charleston in the spring, and thereby threaten all of the southern United States. With that bit of foreshadowing, let's leave the Southern campaign on the back burner. Clinton, Cornwallis, and Lincoln will all be back in the next episode. We're at the end of 1779, and I want to catch up on other things that are going on in the American Revolution. One of the most famous events of the war at least in the United States, is the betrayal of Benedict Arnold, his switch from the American side to the British side. And it's fascinating to me because Arnold is such a paradoxical character. He's a former son of liberty, a guy who was a radical revolutionary before the revolution was really popular. And yet he becomes a traitor. He's a war hero. Remember, he led a crucial attack at Saratoga and was badly wounded in the leg. He almost died. And yet he's a helpless romantic. He craves recognition for his heroism, recognition he feels that he isn't getting from the Continental Army, and widowed just recently in 1775, he also craves romantic love. It's these desires for love and recognition that will ultimately be his undoing. In 1776 and 1777, Arnold spends most of his time in New England, both in Rhode Island and in nearby Boston. During this time, he's caught the attention of a 16-year-old Boston socialite named Betsy de Blois. Now, by today's standards, it's downright creepy and usually illegal for a 36 or 37 year old man to hit on a teenager, but women married much younger in these days, and Benedict Arnold is a major general in the Continental Army, a good catch for any young woman. Unfortunately for Arnold, Betsy is already in love with a young man named Martin Brimmer, an apothecary's apprentice who her parents think is too poor for her to marry. Betsy's parents forbid her from seeing Brimmer, and Brimmer ultimately moves on and marries another woman, but Betsy is adamant. She will have the man she loves, or no one at all. After she repeatedly rejects Benedict Arnold, he writes her a final letter on April 8, 1778, and minus the old-timey prose, this letter sounds like something you would see written by a rejected high school kid. Reads, quote, Dear Madam, Twenty times have I taken up my pen to write you, and as often as my trembling hand refused to obey the dictates of my heart, a heart which has often been calm and serene amidst the clashing of arms and all the din and horrors of war, trembles with diffidence and fear at giving offense when it attempts to address you on a subject so important to its happiness. Long have I struggled in vain to erase your heavenly image from it. 
But neither time, absence, misfortunes, nor your cruel indifference have been able to efface the deep impressions your charms have made. And will you doom a heart so true, so faithful to languish in despair? Shall I expect no returns to the most sincere, ardent, and disinterested passion? Dear Betsy, suffer that heavenly bosom, which surely cannot know itself the cause of misfortune without a sympathetic pang, to expand with friendship at least, and let me know my fate. If a happy one, no man will strive more to deserve it. If on the contrary I am doomed to despair, my latest breath will be to implore the blessing of heaven on the idol, the only wish of my soul. Adieu, dear madam, and believe me most sincerely, your devoted, humble servant, B.A. End quote. Betsy Dubois' response, quote, solicit no further, end quote. In the end, she will live well into her 80s without ever marrying, which is unusual in that age, but she's a modern woman in the sense that she won't marry a man she doesn't love. And, by the way, it turns out that her parents were completely wrong about that young apothecary's apprentice, Martin Brimmer. Not only does he go on to become a wealthy businessman, but his son is ultimately elected mayor of Boston. Anyway, Benedict Arnold is called on to serve in the Saratoga campaign, where he receives the leg wound that puts him out of commission for a while, and he doesn't get back into action until spring of 1778, when he returns to George Washington's army at Valley Forge, where we started today's episode. He walks with a limp, though. His Wounded leg with the compound fracture was set improperly, and now it's about two inches shorter than the other. In part because of his constant pain, Arnold asks George Washington for a desk job, a request that comes as a surprise from such an aggressive and warlike officer. Nonetheless, Washington agrees and appoints him as the military commander of Philadelphia, which at this point the British have just vacated. This is a terrible place for Benedict Arnold. While he is a brave and decisive military leader on the battlefield, he is a poor politician, and rather than soothing passions in the recently occupied city, he tries to make everybody love him, makes a bunch of promises he can't keep, and makes enemies among patriots and loyalists alike. Before long, a group of Philadelphia politicians accuse Arnold of abusing his military position for personal financial gain. He demands a court-martial to clear his name, and the court convenes on June 1, 1779. But because the Continental Army is in the middle of a war, the officers involved have other duties to perform, and the court won't render its verdict until December. While this is going on, Arnold is involved in yet another romance. In late summer of 1778, he meets 18-year-old Peggy Shippen the daughter of a Loyalist judge. Shippen had previously been involved with Captain John Andre, the head of the British Secret Service in America, who I'd mentioned in passing earlier, and now she's got her sights set on Arnold. The attraction seems to be mutual, and after a whirlwind romance, the two are married in April of 1779, less than two months before Benedict Arnold's court-martial begins. It's around this time that Arnold begins to consider switching sides. Certainly he feels insulted by the Continental Army. Certainly he's now married to a loyalist and involved with a bunch of loyalist politicians and socialites. It's tough to say what exactly pushes him over the edge. Regardless, Arnold begins communicating with 
that head of the British Secret Service, John Andre, during the summer of 1779, before his court verdict is returned. He gives Andre details on American troop movements and other military information written in invisible ink on the backs of letters that Peggy exchanges with friends on the other side of the British lines, and those friends then pass them on to uh, Captain Andre. Despite the seriousness of several of the charges against Benedict Arnold, the court-martial convicts him of only a couple of trivial charges of corruption, and his only punishment is a mild reprimand from George Washington. Now, instead of accepting this for what it is, a speed bump in an otherwise promising career, Benedict Arnold sees it as yet another betrayal. Just as General Gates had left him unmentioned in his reports at Saratoga, General Washington is now reprimanding him. I could spend an entire episode talking about how things escalate from here, uh, but to sum things up, Benedict Arnold is appointed commander of West Point, which at the time is known as Fort Arnold and probably still would be if it hadn't been for his treason. As commander of West Point, Arnold offers to turn over the fort to the British in exchange for a large sum of money and a commission in the British Army. The plot nearly succeeds, but when Arnold is meeting with Captain Andre to finalize the deal, the British ship that has carried Andre behind American lines is spotted and fired on by a pair of militiamen with their muskets. These men pose no real threat to the British warship, they're just taking pot shots at it, but the ship's captain, unfortunately for Captain Andre, is hit by a splinter that flies up when one of these musket balls hits his ship, so the captain decides to withdraw, and this leaves Captain Andre trapped behind American lines. General Arnold writes him up some fake papers and sends him on his way. Uh, these papers are supposed to get him across American lines back to the British, but Andre is caught on September 23, 1780, and at the time, he's carrying not only these forged papers, but detailed plans of the American defenses at West Point. He is caught dead to rights as a spy. Benedict Arnold is supposed to be having breakfast with George Washington the next morning when word of Andre's arrest and his own betrayal arrives. He gets word only a few minutes before Washington finds out, which is when he's supposed to sit down with Washington. And, well, instead of going to breakfast, Arnold flees for a barge, which takes him across British lines. Captain Andre is hanged for his part in the plot, but the British are true to their word and award Benedict Arnold with a position in the army. He writes to George Washington, asking for safe passage for Peggy from Philadelphia, which Washington grants. At the same time, on October 7, 1780, Benedict Arnold writes a letter titled To the Inhabitants of America, which is published in most American newspapers. In it, Arnold explains the reasons for his betrayal in his own words. He says in part, quote, Having fought by your side when the love of our country animated our arms, I shall expect from your justice and candor what your deceivers, with more art and less honesty, will find it inconsistent with their own views to admit. When I quitted domestic happiness for the perils of the field, I conceived the rights of my country in danger, and that duty and honor called me to her defense. A redress of grievances was my only object and aim. However, 
I acquiesced in a step which I thought precipitate. The Declaration of Independence To justify the measure, many plausible reasons were urged which could no longer exist when Great Britain, with the open arms of a parent offered to embrace us as children and grant the wished-for redress. And now that her worst enemies are in her own bosom, I should change my principles if I conspired with their designs. Yourselves being judges, was the war the less just because fellow subjects were considered as our foes? You have felt the torture in which we raised our arms against a brother. God inclined the guilty protractors of these unnatural dissensions to resign their ambition and cease from their delusions and compassion to kindred blood. I anticipate your question. Was not the war a defensive one until the French joined in the combination? I answer that I thought so. You will add, was it not afterwards necessary till the separation of the British Empire was complete? By no means. In contending for the welfare of my country, I am free to declare my opinion that, this end attained, all strife should have ceased. I lamented, therefore, the impolicy, tyranny, and injustice with which a sovereign contempt of the people of America studiously neglected to take their collective sentiments of the British proposals of peace and to negotiate under a suspension of arms. Do any believe we were at that time really entangled by an alliance with France? Unfortunate deception. And thus they have been duped by a virtuous credulity. In the incautious moments of intemperate passion, to give up their fidelity to serve a nation counting both the will and the power to protect us, and aiming at the destruction both of the mother country and the provinces. In the plainness of common sense, for I pretend to no casuistry, did the pretended treaty with the court of Versailles amount to more than an overture to America? Certainly not, because no authority had been given by the people to conclude it, nor to this very hour have they authorized its ratification. The Articles of Confederation remain still unsigned. Before the insidious offers of France, I preferred those from Great Britain, thinking it infinitely wiser and safer to cast my confidence upon her justice and generosity than to trust a monarchy too feeble to establish your independency, so perilous to her distant dominions, the enemy of the Protestant faith, and fraudulently avowing an affection for the liberties of mankind while she holds her native sons in vassalage and chains." I affect no disguise, and therefore frankly declare that in these principles I had determined to retain my arms and command for an opportunity to surrender them to Great Britain. And in concerting the measures for a purpose, in my opinion, as grateful as it would have been beneficial to my country, I was only solicitous to accomplish an event of decisive importance, and to prevent, as much as possible in the execution of it, the effusion of blood. With the highest satisfaction, I bear testimony to my old fellow soldiers and citizens, that I find solid ground to rely upon the clemency of our sovereign, and abundant conviction that it is the generous intention of Great Britain, not only to have the rights and privileges of the colonies unimpaired, together with their perpetual exemption from taxation, but to superadd such further benefits as may consist with the common prosperity of the empire. End quote. Benedict Arnold is saying that he's only trying to do what's best for the United States. He says, basically, we've got what we want. Any more fighting just plays into the hands of the French, who don't care about America, really, and hate Britain. Of course, there's the question of him demanding payment and a commission from the British, as well as the whole question of his wife's involvement and Arnold's feeling that the Continental Army has disrespected him. He's a complicated guy with complicated motives, and he is the highest-ranking officer to switch sides in the American Revolution. Where we are in our story in 1779, 
Benedict Arnold's final betrayal is still a year in the future, and he is in the midst of his romance with Peggy Shippen. Let's return to 1779 for a minute, because there's one more very important thing that happens that year, and that is the entry of Spain into the American Revolution. Now, Spain has been quietly helping the Americans ever since 1776. U.S. ships have been granted access to the port of Havana, Cuba, to trade on a duty-free basis, which is something the Spanish don't do with anybody. They also do what the French do and send weapons and ammunition to the United States, mostly via third-party traders, and they do this largely for the same reason that France does it. The British Empire is getting too powerful. So powerful that it might be able to dictate the course of European politics. And from the Spanish point of view, that cannot be allowed to happen. At the same time, Spain is in a different position from France geopolitically. Instead of just a few territories, the Spanish have many. They have several in the Caribbean, as well as Mexico, the Louisiana Territory in Central North America, and, oh yes, control of South America. Well, most of it. The Spanish are nervous about setting a precedent for wars of independence in the Americas, and they correctly see the U.S. as a potential future rival. Well, up until early 1778, it doesn't really matter. Spain is not getting involved in any wars because from 1776 through 1777, well, the Spanish are tied down in their own costly war with Portugal, and peace negotiations drag on through March of 1778. The Spanish win the war against the Portuguese, uh, taking control of modern-day Uruguay. And while they spend the next year negotiating with the French to join the war against Britain, it will take them until April of 1779 to prepare, and on the 12th of that month, they sign the Treaty of Aranjuez with France. In this treaty, Spain agrees to support French naval efforts against Great Britain, as well as to attack British colonies in the Caribbean. Spain does not go so far as to recognize American independence, though. Like I said, the Spanish do not want to set that kind of precedent in the Americas, and there's actually a clause in the Treaty of Aranjuez that stipulates that Spanish troops are not to be deployed to the 13 colonies. In fact, there are even a couple of secret clauses that end up working against the United States. In one, France and Spain agree that France is to maintain control of the fishing grounds off of Newfoundland, which the U.S. would like to have. More importantly, Another secret clause says that France and Spain will sign no separate peace agreement with Great Britain, and that they won't make peace until Spain has retaken Gibraltar from the British. And the reason this is a problem is that France and the United States have already agreed to make no separate peace with the British. So, the U.S. has promised not to make peace without France, and now France has gone and promised not to make peace without Spain, which means that, at least in theory, the United States won't be able to make peace with Great Britain until and unless the Spanish retake Gibraltar, which has nothing remotely to do with U.S. independence. In the long term, this will contribute to America's resistance to what George Washington calls foreign entanglements in European affairs. And until World War I, the United States will more or less avoid alliances with European countries. 
On balance, though, the Spanish will be providing much-needed help to the American cause. In summer of 1779, a joint Franco-Spanish fleet attempts an invasion of Great Britain. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. What they actually do is sail around off the British coast, which terrifies the locals because the British fleet is mostly deployed overseas, but the French and the Spanish can't stop bickering about the best place to make landfall, and they end up turning back in September because winter's coming and mounting an invasion in the winter would be foolish. It would be hard to supply their troops. This wasted effort ties down some British resources, but probably does more harm than good since there's an entire French army waiting to be deployed to England that could have gone somewhere else and instead has spent the entire summer just sitting around in France. The invasion or attempted invasion of Great Britain might have been a complete fiasco, but the siege of Gibraltar on the other hand, has an incredible impact on the American Revolutionary War. Gibraltar is a geopolitical oddity. This is the land that the Spanish want to take as their price for participating in the war, and it's easy to understand why when you look a little bit closer at Gibraltar. This tiny 2.6 square mile patch of ground at the southern tip of Spain has been a British possession since 1713. The British had taken over the town of Gibraltar during the War of the Spanish Succession, intending to hand it over to Archduke Charles of Austria, the British-backed candidate for the Spanish throne. In order to get Britain to accept French-backed candidate King Philip V as king instead, Spain agreed to let the British keep Gibraltar permanently, and it's been a thorn in their side ever since. Gibraltar sits on a tiny peninsula that juts south from the Spanish mainland. Most of the peninsula is occupied by the Rock of Gibraltar, a 1,400-foot-tall monolith that's three-quarters of a mile wide and nearly three miles long. This rock mostly blocks the narrow isthmus that connects Gibraltar to the mainland, except for a strip of land on the western edge of the rock. Most of the usable land is at the southwest, where a harbor provides both a base for ships and a means of supply. Despite its size, this tiny bit of land is incredibly valuable. From Gibraltar, on a clear day, you can see across the Strait of Gibraltar to Morocco, so a fleet based here can control access to and from the Mediterranean. Even if you don't have a fleet here, a lookout can tell you who's coming and going, which is pretty valuable intelligence. It's easy to understand why Spain would want this land back, and it's equally easy to understand why Britain would want to keep it. And when France and Spain lay siege to Gibraltar in June of 1779, Britain's priorities immediately shift. The North American colonies are relatively poor and expensive to control to begin with. Even the Caribbean colonies are distant. But Gibraltar is in Europe, right in Britain's backyard. And it's incredibly strategically important, so all of a sudden this little territory moves to the top of Britain's priority list. Now, the siege of Gibraltar is a long story, and I'm not going to be able to do it justice here. It's one of those things you should really look up if you want a more in-depth explanation, but I want to give a brief sketch because it's important. The Spanish deploy their troops across the Isthmus and cut the British off from the mainland. Meanwhile, a French fleet attacks the British-owned island of Menorca in the Mediterranean. 
The idea is to stretch British resources in the region, which should make both attacks, the attack on Menorca and the attack on Gibraltar, easy to pull off. The Spanish attack with 14,000 troops, with 11 ships of the line and two frigates blocking Gibraltar's little harbor. By comparison, the British defenders number fewer than 6,000, with a single frigate, 12 gunboats, and an old ship of the line that's kept permanently anchored as a floating artillery battery. In terms of men and ships, the British are certainly at a disadvantage. What they do have, though, is a locally raised engineering corps called the Soldier Artificer Company. Governor George Eliot puts this corps to work, building stone walls around the town and mounting over 400 cannons. Meanwhile, his soldiers train local men to serve as militia and bolster the defenses. While this is going on, rather than launch a direct assault, the Spanish decide to starve the British out and set up a series of forts and trenches across the isthmus north of the rock, basically ensuring that any resupply will have to come through the harbor, which is protected by the Spanish ships, and by winter, Gibraltar's garrison is almost out of food. The people are suffering from malnutrition, and many are losing their teeth from scurvy. And almost as bad, they don't even have enough fuel for cooking or heat. And they're reduced to breaking up old ships from the harbor and cutting them up for firewood. Gibraltar is on the verge of surrender when, in January of 1780, a British fleet under the command of Admiral George Rodney would sail to resupply the beleaguered fortress town. On his way south, Rodney would win two battles against Spanish fleets, including the Battle of St. Vincent off the Portuguese coast, where he would capture five Spanish ships of the line. When Rodney arrives at Gibraltar on January 25, 1780, his fleet is so imposing that the Spanish blockade ships simply back off and let them enter the harbor. Rodney brings with him not just literal boatloads of supplies from Britain, but also additional supplies captured from the Spanish fleets, as well as about a thousand Scottish Highlanders to help with the defenses. The British and Spanish land forces stand off for another year until once again British supplies are running low and once again a convoy comes to the rescue. This time it's an even bigger convoy with about a hundred supply ships and 29 ships of the line under Vice Admiral George Darby. This convoy is absolutely enormous, which gives you an idea of how important Gibraltar is to the British. It arrives on April 12, 1781, and when it leaves on April 21st, it takes with it most of Gibraltar's civilian population. This numbers about a thousand people. That's a thousand fewer mouths to feed and a thousand fewer innocents in the line of fire. And that last point is important because while this fleet is unloading supplies, the Spanish have bombarded the town to try and destroy these supplies as they're being taken off the ships. But the fleet is unloading at the south end of Gibraltar where it's out of Spanish artillery range. So the Spanish shells fall all over the north end of town and destroy a bunch of buildings. They don't just destroy buildings and threaten the lives of civilians, but they cause discipline to break down among some of the British troops. See, amongst the Spanish shells are incendiary shells. These are cannonballs with explosives inside them, that are meant to start buildings on fire. And when 
duds fall into civilian buildings, the buildings have to be evacuated and soldiers have to go in and dispose of the shells. And this leads to the discovery of secret stocks of goods, including alcohol, that people and merchants in town have been hiding from the troops. According to Colonel John Drinkwater, a British Army officer and later historian who's present during the siege, quote, The first and second days they conducted themselves with great propriety, but on the eve of the third day their discipline was overpowered by their inebriation, and from that instant, regardless of punishment or the entreaties of their officers, they were guilty of many and great excesses. The enemy's shells soon forced open the secret recesses of the merchants, and the soldiers instantly availed themselves of the opportunity to seize upon the liquors, which they conveyed to haunts of their own. There, in parties, they barricaded their quarters against all opposers, and, insensible of their danger, regaled themselves with the spoils. Several skirmishes occurred amongst them, which, if not seasonably put to a stop by the interference of officers, might have ended in serious consequences. End quote. After this second successful British resupply by sea, the Spanish decide that they won't be able to starve Gibraltar out, so they draw up plans for a direct attack. They start building new elevated platforms in order to support this attack, although construction is slowed in midsummer when a lucky British cannon shot hits a Spanish ammunition magazine and creates an explosion that's so huge that flaming debris falls and lights up smaller magazines and ammo caches along the defensive line, causing a series of explosions and terrifying the besiegers. In late November, the British get intelligence that the Spanish are finally going to attack, so they launch a preemptive strike of their own on the night of November 27th, using around 2,500 men, or about a third of the defenders. These men take the Spanish completely by surprise, and while there are few casualties on either side, the British are able to inflict a ton of damage on the Spanish position. They knock down a bunch of those elevated gun platforms. They spike the cannons, and as they return to their own lines, they set and light long fuses to the powder magazines in the area, causing more explosions and destruction. Overnight, these British raiders undo several months of Spanish preparation. In February of 1782, the Spanish start getting more help from the French. That month, the British garrison on the Mediterranean island of Menorca has surrendered, freeing up French troops and ships as well as expert siege engineers. The attackers start building even bigger and better gun batteries to bombard the defenders. Meanwhile, the British are using the Soldier Artificer Company, that little engineering corps, to blast tunnels through the inside of the Rock of Gibraltar and create holes in the side of it where they can emplace artillery and fire down on the French and the Spanish. So they're turning this giant monolith into a fortress. In September of 1782, the French and Spanish decide to take one last shot and put everything they have into an all-out assault on Gibraltar. On September 8th, knowing that an attack is imminent, Governor Elliot orders his artillery to fire on the Spanish batteries and trenches with cannonballs that have been heated up until they're red hot. And this heated shot is something that the British call roasted potatoes. And the roasted potatoes cause several fires and explosions among the Spanish and the French that kill almost 300 men, but it does not 
stop the attack. On September 13th, the attack comes by land and sea. By sea, the French and the Spanish don't just use their regular fleets. They also use several old ships which have been converted specially just for the occasion. And these ships have been converted into what they call floating batteries. Guns are mounted on one side of the ship only, and that side is armored with three feet of layered wood and sand with water pumps to keep it from catching fire. The other side of the ship, meanwhile, is filled with heavy ballast to keep it on an even keel. And these floating batteries, these platforms, allow the French and the Spanish to bring huge amounts of firepower to bear on Gibraltar. They'll sort of float them in sideways towards the town, and then when they've reached as close as they can on the tide, they will drop anchor and remain in place and bombard Gibraltar's defenses while the French and Spanish ships of the line keep the small British harbor fleet busy. In all, this Spanish fleet is bringing around 140 artillery pieces to the party. It includes more than 35,000 men, and there are around 43,000 men attacking over land, with around 85 cannons of their own. Against this force, the British have only around 7,500 men, although they do have 400 artillery pieces. As the battle opens, the two sides begin to hammer away at each other with their artillery, and very quickly it turns into a slugfest. They're going to see whose defenses will crack first. And once again, the British are using heated shot, and they decide to ignore the Spanish land artillery and focus on the floating batteries. At first, the roasted potatoes are ineffective, and the Spanish water pumps on these ships are able to keep up and keep the temperature down. But around one in the morning, two of the Spanish batteries are on fire, and others are beginning to smolder. In his book, Gibraltar and its Sieges, with a description of its natural features, British author Frederick George Stevens writes, quote, The trouble and despair of the enemy now reached a climax. The Spaniards hastened to send off all their boats, which surrounded the floating batteries, in order to save their crews, an operation accomplished with much coolness and courage in spite of the peril attending it. For not only was it necessary to brave the British fire, but to incur the greatest risk in approaching the burning vessels. Never, perhaps, says a writer, did a more horrible or deplorable spectacle present itself to the eyes of men. The deep darkness that shrouded the distant earth and sea vividly contrasted with the columns of flame that rose upwards from the blazing racks, and the shrieks of the victims were heard even above the roar of the incessant cannonade. Brigadier Curtis, who, with his brigade, was encamped at Europa, finding that the moment had come for bringing into operation his little flotilla of twelve gunboats, each of which carried an eighteen or twenty-four pounder in its bow, drew them up in such a manner as to take the floating batteries in flank. This crossfire compelled the relieving boats to retire. As morning dawned, Curtis pushed forward and captured a couple of launches loaded with men. These boats attempted to escape, but surrendered after a shot had killed and wounded several on board. The horror of the scene was now almost too great to witness. The daylight showed a piteous spectacle. In the midst of the flames appeared the unhappy Spaniards, who, with loud shrieks, implored compassion, or flung themselves into the waves. Some, on the point of drowning, clung with frenzied grasps to the sides of their burning ships, or to find any floating spar which came within their reach, while 
in the depths of their despair, they implored the compassion and succor of the victors. Moved by a sight so painful, the English listened to humanity alone, and, ceasing their fire, occupied themselves solely with the rescue of their enemies, a proceeding the more generous on their part as it exposed them to the most imminent hazard. Curtis, in particular, covered himself with glory, and freely risked his own life to save that of his fellow creatures. He led his boats up to the burning, smoking hulks to assist the poor wretches on the point of falling victim to the fire or the waves. Climbing on board the battering ships, with his own hands he helped down the Spaniards, who loaded him with words of gratitude. While he and his men were thus generously engaged, the flames reached the magazine of one of the battering ships to the northward, and about five o'clock it blew up, with a crash which seemed to shake the very rock. A quarter of an hour later, another, in the center of the line, met with a similar fate. The burning rack of the latter was hurled in every direction, and involved the British gunboats in serious danger. One was sunk, but happily the crew were saved. A hole was forced through the bottom of the brigadier's boat, his coxswain was killed, the strokesman wounded, and for some time the crew were enveloped in a cloud of smoke. After this, the brigadier deemed it prudent to retire under cover of the rock, to avoid the peril arising from further explosions. End quote. While their fleet is burning, and in some cases exploding, the French and Spanish land army can only watch. In an embarrassing turn of events, they had run out of gunpowder around nightfall, so they can't even take pot shots at the British gunboats or launch a serious charge against the British defenses with the necessary artillery support that would be required. The attack has failed, and the Franco-Spanish force returns to their original lines to resume their siege once more. That siege will last several more months until February of 1783, and will only be halted by a preliminary peace agreement that allows the British to keep Gibraltar, although the Spanish would get the island of Menorca as a consolation prize. At three years, seven months, and twelve days, the siege of Gibraltar is the longest battle by far in the American Revolutionary War and the longest siege in British military history. And while the battle itself would yield no tangible results for the Spanish Empire, French and Spanish troops would tie down huge quantities of British naval resources, allowing the war to be decided elsewhere. And that's why it's relevant. Hey everybody, it's Dan again, and I'm here to remind you that if you're only listening to relevant history, you're not getting all of my content. Every month, I release a video episode of a series called Dan's War College. This series covers historical battles, military units, weapons, trends, and other military-related topics, and you can get access to it for $5 a month on Patreon. In addition to access to the video series, patrons also get access to a private Discord channel for members only, and I do take episode requests from patrons. If you're interested in that and in supporting the show, which I very much appreciate, the Patreon link is in the description. Of course, there are other ways to support the show as well. The easiest is simply to share it with your friends, share it on social media, on Reddit, and on other platforms where people are looking for podcast recommendations. The audience grows by word of mouth, and every little bit helps. 
You'll also notice links to most of my sources in the episode description. These links allow you to buy the various books I have used for relevant history and read the complete story for yourself. And the neat thing about these links is that they are affiliate links, so at no extra cost to you, I get a small percentage of what you spend on the book you were going to buy anyway. So it's a win-win scenario, and it helps the show. Finally, if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach out on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. Or you can send me an email at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.